May 23rd select board meeting to Reporting order. Reporting in progress. And the first item of the May 23rd select board meeting is the uh, approval of the agenda. Move. Second. Move and second it. Are there any, <clears throat> any changes requested? Uh, anything to add, Kathleen? You'll note that we did add to the agenda a letter of support for the um, Otter Creek Child Cares uh, application for <coughs> support from the Northern Borders Regional Commission. And okay. I'll circulate that for your We support. had one addition to our consent agenda since we, uh, since we warned it. Uh, hearing no others then, all in favor of approving the agenda with the addition uh, to the consent agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Next is approval of the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, any comments on the consent agenda? Number of pieces in here. Uh, <coughs> one is uh, it, it's uh, the. Charter House Coalition needs a certificate of, of our approval to uh, apply for their grant programs. Uh, we have a letter of support for the Otter Creek Child Care Center grant proposal and um, a request for extension to filing our 2023 grant list uh, in reference to completing the Vermont Property Information Exchange Program <coughs> among the uh, the minutes were there any comments on the minutes anybody changes on the minutes no. okay I wasn't at that meeting uh, so hearing no changes all in favor of approving the consent agenda as drafted signified by saying aye 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 okay and next is citizen comments <coughs> is there anybody here for something that's not on the agenda is there anybody out um, online that has comments? No. None? Okay. We we'll move past that to some public assemblage permit requests. <coughs> and um, Ted Ty uh, has got the. Uh, Memorial Day Parade public assemblage permit application into us. It's the uh, American Legion Post 27. Uh, the annual uh, Memorial Day Parade for May 29th, 2023. The parade will begin at Porter Field, ending at the intersection of Exchange Street, Court Street. And following the parade, there will be a memorial service at the Soldiers Monument in front of the Town Hall Theater. Any questions on that public assemblage permit? I just have a question to Kathleen about the permit itself. I see there's a lot, a lot of lines crossing the on the first paragraph. Does that mean that it's not included that language? No, um, that was simply that there were some lines on the original form yeah. that okay. the per, that the um, yeah because the those person lines right through. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Okay. Then any, I'm good with that. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none. Uh, pleasure of the board. I'll move to approve the submitted <coughs> public assembly permit application submitted by the Millbury American Legion Post 27 for the Memorial Day Parade on May 29th, 2023. Second. Moving and seconded. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Oh, Andy's oh right. hey. Andy, hey. <laughs> that doesn't look like a car. You must have already reached your destination. Couldn't stay away. It's so exciting here. <laughs> okay. Uh, next is uh, the BMP, and it looks like Karen's with us, so we'll let her present uh, the BMP's public assemblage permit. <clears throat> Well, that is okay, from a car. From a baseball game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look at the ten. How you guys doing? Good. Good. Can you hear me okay? We can. We can. Okay. 
All right, so you guys got the um, permit application for the block party that we're proposing on July 29th. Um, we're looking to do this on Main Street further down the way that we used to do it with the sod in the streets. Um, so proposing that the road get closed from the intersection of merchants to mill, leaving both of those roads open. Um, sod would go over the bridge the way that we've done that in years past. Um, we'd have food, a stage with black music at the end of Mill Street. Uh, or sorry, right before that intersection, so that would sort of be like mm -hmm. the beginning of that part of the event. Um, any questions? Just one. I've chatted. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I see the mention of Tiger Day. When, when did this start? I didn't know that. That was my question too. <laughs> so I, I was approached by uh, some folks early in the year. Um, so July 29th is World Tiger Day, and um, and it is also a special, a couple special reunion years um, for MUHS. And so uh, there is a crew of folks that is wanting to incorporate um, a sort of MUHS reunion. Um, kind of all years along with the block party. So this is really going to be sort of a, a kind of huge celebration of community all across the board. So we're going to try to find ways to incorporate this. They're looking to do an after party, I believe. Um, and so they're taking care of that piece of it. I'm doing the block party piece, but we were, we want to put like tiger paws on all the windows and, um, you know, possibly like a, a orange and black balloon arch that people can take pictures under and just kind of incorporate. I wanted to see if we can get the tiger mascot for pictures um, and really just sort of, a, you know, a fun community feeling. So we'll incorporate some tiger stuff to this. Cool. So when you advertise for this block party, you are going to be <coughs> mentioning the tiger. Hopefully you're promoting them yes. too. Yes. Can you repeat that for us? <laughs> No, hopefully you're going to be promoting the Tiger Day also. <laughs> yes, we, yes. <laughs> I'm not proposing that we have any live tigers. <laughs> um, but I do, yes, we will be promoting both things um, happening all at the same time. Great, yeah, that's good. Any other questions about the uh, block party? Mm -mm. Okay, pleasure of the board. I move to approve the submitted public assemblage permit application submitted by the BMP for the proposed Block Party Tiger Day event to be held on July 29th, 2023. Second. Andy seconded. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was way out there before <laughs> Lindsay was. <laughs> I lose on Zoom. He wants to feel like he's participating here. I love it. Okay, <laughs> all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Sounds Thank good. You Thank, Thank you, you Karen. Enjoy the game. Thank you. Bye. So with that, we're gonna invite Fred in to uh, give us a presentation on tax increment financing here in Vermont. Evening, Fred. Hello there. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Fabulous. Great to see you all. Good to join you tonight. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. I'm up in um, Richmond taking care of my dad this week. Um, so I'm Fred Jenny, Executive Director of the Addison County Economic Development Corporation. Um, and uh, before I came to um, down to the beautiful Addison County, I worked uh, for the state of Vermont for 16 years as executive director of the Vermont Economic Progress Council. And uh, two of the programs I ran were the Vermont Employment Growth Incentives and the Tax Increment Financing Program. So I got a little bit of experience with the program and the Kathleen asked me to give you an overview of how the program works. And I hope to, hope to keep you ahead of schedule and even with, even with some questions. Um, 
So back uh, in 2017, before I left the state and came to Addison County, um, based on some discussions actually in Middlebury, I wrote uh, a new TIF program called Project Based TIF, um, which with Brian himself, we've been trying to get enacted in the legislature since then. So maybe during the 2024 legislative session, the uh, seventh time would be the charm to get that program passed. I think it'll be a very helpful uh, version of TIF for, for Middlebury. Um, also, before I uh, left FC, I did present on TIF to the select board. That was way back in 2017. Uh, there's been some um, faces of change there in the select board, and things have changed in, in Montpelier, so this will be kind of an update as well, and just to bring the new folks up to, up to speed. Um, so I'm going to provide a, a broad overview of Vermont's uh, tax increment financing program for you. Go ahead to the next slide, that one. Um, so tax increment financing, or TIF, is used all around the country by many different, different taxing authorities. It's primarily used to encourage private sector development uh, by financing infrastructure that's required by the private development developer to get the development done. Uh, it's been in Vermont statute since the 80s, but it's gone through many, many changes over the years, not the least of which was when Act 60 passed and added the new layer of the education property tax. Um, so the big, kind of the big differences between Vermont's tax tip program and other programs around the country are, as you know, we have a unique two-tier property tax system. So there are two taxing authorities involved, the municipality and the state education fund. Uh, another difference is that Vermont only allows use of pro property tax increments. Many programs around the country use a lot of different taxes or all the taxes that are generated within a TIF district to fund infrastructure and in some cases development as well, not just the infrastructure. Um, another difference is that Vermont only allows municipalities to use the education property tax to finance public infrastructure that will encourage private development. In many cities around the country, TIF can be used directly to finance <coughs> private development. That's not the case in Vermont. <coughs> There's a lot of other differences, and TIF differs from place to place. Place to place. Suffice it to say that what I'm going to describe uh, to you now is how the TIF program currently works in Vermont. I'm going to start by defining TIF um, in Vermont, both financially and geographically. You can go to the, uh, this is the financial one. No, go back, sorry, too quick there. <laughs> so financially, TIF is a municipal financing tool to build public infrastructure that encourages private development that will generate new or incremental property tax revenue which are used in part to service the debt incurred by the municipality to build its public infrastructure. Seems simple enough, but of course, the devil is in the details. So what this graphic shows is kind of the, the cycle of um, TIF financing. You bond, you build the infrastructure, private developer uh, does development or redevelopment, and that generates um, increment, property tax increment, that can help pay back the bond. That's how, what TIF is financially. Geographically, the next slide. A TIF, a TIF district is an area that's designated by the municipality um, within which the municipality wants to encourage private sector development. And public infrastructure is required for that development to occur. Vermont statute defines where and how a TIF district can be created. For example, uh, one of the places you can create a TIF district is within a designated downtown. I think this, I think this graphic shows Springfield's designated downtown, which is also their TIF district. Um, the project-based TIF concept I mentioned, which has not passed yet, uh, would allow TIF to be used for one development project that requires specific and concentrated public infrastructure. It avoids having to create a whole 
big district and avoid dealing with multiple property owners, multiple developers, and multiple infrastructure projects. It's a much simpler model. So hopefully we can get that enacted um, soon in Vermont. Next slide. So this graphic shows how TIP works over time. Um, note that it, what it's illustrating here is only the um, education property tax part of it. But the municipal property tax works basically the same way. It just applies different percentages uh, to the increment. And I apologize that this slide has not been updated. Those percentages are in incorrect. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. Also note that this graphic illustrates that it doesn't change how property taxes are assessed or how individual property owners pay their taxes. It only impacts what happens with property tax revenue after um, they are collected by the municipality. So nothing happens directly to property owners. It's what happens after you collect all the property tax. So the blue bar in the middle represents the base tax is what's known in HIP language as the original taxable value. That's the original taxable value of all the properties within the TIF district on the date the district is created. The property taxes that are generated by that value continue to go to the municipality on the municipal side and continue to go to the ed fund on the state you know, education side education fund side. So that continues forever. That base value, the taxes go where they normally go. The green and light blue section at the top um, uh, represent the what happens sort of show what happens to the increment, any increment that's generated once the public infrastructure gets built and properties within the district are improved, redeveloped by the developers. So you get increased value, so that generates new incremental property tax revenues. And what happens with that is 80%, not 70%, the green section uh, of the incremental education property taxes go to the TIP fund that's created to service infrastructure debt, and 20% go continue going to the ed fund. So there's a split of the increment to the um, to the um, to fund and going to the debt fund. Similarly, with the um, with the municipal property taxes, statute requires that not less than eighty percent, eighty-five percent of the incremental municipal property tax also go to the debt fund, and the remainder goes to the municipality. So there's a split or a statutory split of the um, of the municipal increment as well to the to the um, municipality and to the uh, tip fund to pay for for infrastructure debt. Then you see at the that line on the right is the 20 year period after which uh, hopefully by which all the debt is paid off. Um, well, even if it's not paid off by that point, you don't get to retain the increment anymore. So hopefully, oh, it coincides with when the debt is paid off. You can pay for your debt long enough for a longer period, but um, hopefully if you, re if you have retained enough incremental revenue to pay off the debt for as long as it takes. But once that happens, once the debt's paid off, 100% of the increase, the base and the increase, goes to the Ed Fund and to the municipality. And I won't go into it now, um, but down the bottom, the orange part there, shows the different time periods uh, in statute. Um, for example, you know, the 10-year period to incur debt and the 20-year period that you get to retain increment. Next slide. So what is the, what is the purpose of TIF districts? Well, it's, that's defined by statute as well. And it defines the purpose as a public-private partnership to provide revenue beyond what a municipality can afford to develop public infrastructure that encourages private development or redevelopment that's desired by the municipality. And that short sentence is where all the rules come from. 
um, to create a TIF district, the municipality has to find, at the formal findings, that the infrastructure improvements will serve the district, no <clears throat> matter where they are, they have to serve the district, um, and that there's a causality or nexus, they call it, between the infrastructure and the private development. Um, and that the private development will result in job creation, will broaden the tax base, and enhance the economic vitality of the municipality, the region, or the state. Um, so those formal findings have to be, um, you know, the municipality has to make those findings as part of the process of creating a TIF district um, before they make an application to the state. Do um, you want me to wait till the end for questions or? Yes, please. Okay. So how does a TIF district get created? Well, it's not an easy process, but um, so far 10, 10 11 municipalities, 12 districts by now have created them. Not all successfully. Uh, I think they all created them successfully, whether they managed them successfully is another story, but most of them have been very successful. I'm sure you've heard stories about St. Albans and Hartford and the success that they, they've had with their redevelopment. But how does it get created? Well, first, municipality has to undertake some free tip planning activities, such as feasibility studies, downtown plans, zoning changes, et cetera. I think Millbury has accomplished a lot of that already, especially for your downtown area. Next, the, the municipality has to develop a TIF district plan uh, that includes a project description, a development schedule. So you have to know who your developers are and what they plan to do, or at least in concept. You have to develop a financing plan, uh, detailed projections of infrastructure costs, uh, projections of the tax, of tax increment revenues that'll be generated based on the expected private development and a statement of need uh, with evidence of why the TIP tools are required to accomplish the plan. So it's all typically done using a consultant firm, uh, but a substantial amount of municipal staff time is required to work up the development plan and the finance plan and all those details. Um, once that is done, when the plan is ready, the select board acts. Um, the select board has to give public notice, hold a public <coughs> meeting on the plan, and then they have to vote to adopt the statement of purpose, to adopt the plan, to create the TIF district, and to pledge up to 85% or at least 85% of the municipal increment to the TIF fund to pay for the debt. Once that's all done, then the town clerk files, files the uh, plan officially for the town. Once the municipality creates the TIF district, taking all those steps, then and you create the district, the select board votes to create the district, the debt clock starts. You have five years from that date to incur the debt for the uh, infrastructure. There is an opportunity to extend another five years with an application of FC, but the, the in statutory length is five years. And then you get ready and uh, submit your plan and finance plan to that state. Um, so once uh, the municipal process concludes, you know, on the next slide, how uh, it's considered by the state. Now you're at the state level, you've done everything at the local level, um, created your plan, created your finance plan, and you're ready to submit to the state. Once you're ready to do that, making sure that you fully followed all the procedures that are laid out in statute at the local level, especially regarding public hearings, uh, an application and a plan is filed with Betsy. Um, the Vermont Economic Progress Council meets once a month, and it takes two to three meetings to consider a TIP application. Typically, the first one, if the first one, they review the uh, plan um, they get a presentation by town officials and staff. The second meeting typically takes place in town where the, where the TIF district is created. Um, they get, the FC takes public comment and they take a tour of the district. 
Um, then at a subsequent meeting, they wrap everything up, get all the final information that they need, and the town can make any changes that they need to make, and that's the vote to um, approve it or not. Um, BEPSI considers both a TIF district plan and a finance plan. They can do that together, or if the town wants, you can file a, a, a TIF district plan first and come back in with a finance plan later. The finance plan details the debt to be incurred other and other revenue sources the municipality is considering to pay for the infrastructure. Um, the infrastructure does not have to be entirely financed by bonded debt serviced by TIF increment. In fact, the state, the legislature, eventually they all prefer kind of a mix of revenues. It could be primarily TIF revenue, but grants, um, fees, things like that can be put into the mix to help pay for the um, infrastructure debt. Next slide. But what are they considering? when you file your, your plan with um, with Pepsi. Uh, they're not creating the gift district. You've already done that. Um, what they're what they're considering is authorizing the municipality to utilize incremental property tax revenue, uh, education property tax revenue, to service the infrastructure debt. And that approval is based on um, five criteria, some of which have sub-criteria. So the first one is there's statutory criteria that you have to meet. Uh, first being that you have to meet the TIF purpose. I mentioned that that's on the earliest slide what the purpose is. You have to, as I said, gone through the full process at the municipal level correctly. Um, you have to meet the but for. That means that the municipality has to provide evidence of uh, kind of two levels that but for use of TIF, this wouldn't happen. The first level is, is the proposed infrastructure required for the private sector development to occur? Which but for this infrastructure, would the private sector develop this develop or redevelop or not? And the second <coughs> level is, if that's true, is the TIF financing required to pay for the infrastructure? Or could you do it some other way? Um, this is probably the most controversial part of this program. It's also part of the business incentive program as but for as well. But you have to provide evidence, prove it, and you have, have to find that you meet this but for. The next one, next statutory criteria is the location criteria. And there are three. You have to meet two of them. Um, and the question is, is the development one? compact and high density, two, within a state designated area, designated downtown, designated village center, NDA, or third, is it in an economically distressed area? And that is a definition that Middlebury doesn't meet, by the way. Um, so yours would have to be compact and high density and within the designated downtown. And that was totally on purpose several years ago that those location criteria were set by, you can imagine the influence and the people who were making that influence on the legislature. It's all about um, smart growth. Uh, last, the last, uh, the, uh, uh, another statutory criteria is project criteria. There are five of those, and you have to meet three of them. And the first one is need, which is very similar to the but for, does the town need to use this tool to make this happen or not? The second is affordable housing, um, same definition as um, other programs in the state for what affordable housing means. Brownfield remediation or redevelopment is the third one. Uh, business development, so at least one new business or a business expansion with good jobs, quality jobs, with good, good pay and benefits. And the fifth one is transportation enhancement. So you got to have three of those elements within the, the plan, the TIF application, um, that are either being caused by the development or by the infrastructure improvements that you're doing. Um, 
So those are the, criteria, the statutory criteria. Pepsi also looks at the financial and market viability of the plan and the finance plan. Uh, the, the town, you know, is there an understanding of the costs of the infrastructure and and the interest and the projections? Are the projections of the uh, projected private detective development um, are they enough to generate enough revenue to pay the debt? Um, so they, they look at all that. DEPC will set how much up to 80%, how much of their um, education property tax increment you can retain. It doesn't have to be 80%, that's the maximum. So if they look at your plan or you show them your plan that the, the infrastructure you're going to build doesn't require 20 years of 80% of the increment that's going to be generated, they can scale that back to a lower percentage. Um, the next two things they look at are called nexus and proportionality. They're kind of related. Nexus, like I mentioned earlier, they have you have to confirm a connection between the proposed infrastructure and the private development. That has to be causation. Um, and uh, so, you know, because the infrastructure doesn't necessarily have to be occurring within the within the tip district, it can be outside the tip district. But whatever you're doing has to be related to the private development. Related to that is proportionality. They're only going to allow you to, to use a, a certain portion of the revenue, incremental revenue, to pay for a piece of infrastructure. A good example is, um, let's say that the development that's going to occur in your designated downtown slash dip is, uh, needs more water capacity. So you're going to build a new water tower. Right? Um, and of course, that water tower is not going to be built in the middle of downtown. It's probably going to be out on the hill that it's going on. Uh, and so it's outside of the tip district, but it's going to part of it, part of the new capacity is going to serve the tip district. So you have to come up with a formula based on usage and other things, and Betsy will <coughs> confirm, you know, that maybe 20% of the cost of that water tower can be paid for with tip rep. The rest you have to pay for with other resources. So that's nexus and proportionality. So those are the um, those are have to, what you have to do and what the state does to uh, approve a tip district. Um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of some of the pros and cons. Go to the next um, slide. How am I doing on time? It's 7:32. Okay. All right. Um, so some of the pros and cons, the biggest benefit, of course, is the added property uh, value in the expanded brand list once the tip that's paid off. Um, that can all be, you know, there's going to be new development occur. Um, so not only is there, you know, more tax revenue coming in, there's hopefully a larger brand list. Perhaps that could lead to lower taxes for the rest of the town through the improved brand list. There should also be other benefits because of the way TIP is designed. There should be other benefits in town like job creation, affordable housing developed, cleaned up brown fields, improved transportation uh, because of the, of the um, criteria. The downside of TIP is that all Vermont taxpayers are underwriting private development that's been deemed to be too risky by private investors. Um, that's why private public partnership is required to make TIP work. Um, the development could also mean, this isn't necessary, doesn't necessarily happen, but could mean that um, there, there's a need for increased municipal services uh, because of the development. You know, a good example is a, a building gets built, that you have to buy a new fire truck with a longer ladder, for example. So, um, and you're not going to get the full benefit of the increase in the municipal taxes for a while. And you have to pay for that truck um, once the building is built. So there's a delay um, in the, the total benefit that you get from the from the tip district. But in the end, there's an increase in revenue to the state and to the municipality. Um, the biggest risk to the municipality is that um, you go forward, debt is incurred, public infrastructure is built and then the private development fails to occur or doesn't occur at a level that generates sufficient incremental revenue 
to pay the debt. Um, that that is the the big job for the whoever's managing the tip for you. Um, that's what they need to watch out for. Um, the town the town voters the town is responsible. If you incur debt, you know you vote a bond through the bond bank. Their infrastructure, you build the infrastructure, you put shovel the ground, and then you don't end up getting the revenues for it. You're still responsible for that debt. Um, the state's not going to pick it up. So, yeah, that piece of it has to be managed very carefully. A lot of times, what happens is this gets mitigated by development agreements between the municipality and the developer or developers um, to make them at least partially or all all fully <coughs> responsible. If something like that happens. I'm sure you're all familiar with the big hole up in Burlington and the, 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 the story that's going on up there. That's what they did. They had, an, they had an, uh, an development agreement with the developers so that they're at least partially covered because of the whole delay that's been going on. Hopefully it's going to move forward now. That tip was created a long time ago. Um, so when is it the right tool to use? Um, Here's here just some of the things that to think about that should be in place if you're going to about doing a tip district. Um, there's there has to be a need. There should be a need for substantial real property development or redevelopment in a in, the, in a defined area. Um, that development requires a substantial scale of public infrastructure to make it occur, and normal and available means of financing aren't available or insufficient. Uh, normal municipal financing. Um, also, another factor to have in place is that the expected private sector development will generate sufficient incremental property tax, property taxes to finance the infrastructure tax, or we'll do that combined with other resources that you're pursuing. Um, another important factor is to make sure that there are parties interested in developing within the district. Um, don't just go ahead without having someone, you know, that's ready to go and the town needs to be ready when they're ready. It's, a, it's an important timing thing. Also important is that there's a champion or several champions committed to the process and the concept and sufficient resources and staff time to manage the local process, the application process, the debt and finance process overseeing building the infrastructure, managing the developers, and sticking with it for 20 years, uh, including the annual reporting that has to happen. So it's a, a lot of work uh, over a long period of time. Once it's all, all the applications are done, and you know everything's approved and everything's a little easier, but there's still a lot of work to be done in the out years. Um, and you gotta make sure that the project and the plan can meet the state approval criteria that we went through. Just a couple of extra items, the kind of miscellaneous things I want to throw in there that you should know about. Um, one is um, uh, impacts on the on the increment. These are things that the, the man where's managing the process and the TIF has to watch out for these pitfalls. And these have happened in other TIF districts. One is developing non-taxable property. We keep in mind that TIF pays for infrastructure, not buildings. And you want to cause buildings to get developed, but um, you don't want the whole of your TIF district to be causing the development of non-taxable buildings, nonprofits that don't pay taxes or Libraries, for example, um, <clears throat> these are great things, and they could be included in the TIF district. But just remember, they don't generate revenue for to help you pay your debt. Um, the other, the other thing is what, what's called in the trade trading decrement. Believe it or not, there's a word word called decrement, um, and that's the temporary elimination of taxable property when it's getting redeveloped. So let's say part of your TIF district was to get the Ben Franklin building redeveloped. Well, for a period of time, it's going to be torn down and there's going to be nothing there, and probably no one's paying property taxes on it. Um, one of the changes, 
this was always true, but a change that was confirmed in law and statute this year is the town municipality is responsible for the original taxable value of any property within the TIF district. So let's say that's part of the project. You tear down the Ben Franklin building while the infrastructure is getting built, while that building is not redeveloped, and is, as you know, there's at least a one year lag until a new property goes on the grand list. So this could be two or three, four years that that property, that <coughs> parcel is not generating property tax. Well, you're still responsible for the original taxable value of that property to the grant, to the ed top. So that's, that's called creating decrement. You, you, there's less value than it was when you started. Uh, and you gotta watch for that. Um, it, it's not that you can't get around it and deal with it, but you just have to watch for it. Um, excess revenues, just, just common sense, but of course, if you've collected enough revenue over the years, over the, the tip period, that is more than you need to pay your debt. What's the excess is paid to the end fund and to the municipality. Uh, there is something called related costs. This is a good thing. Uh, these are costs for, to run a TIF and to operate a TIF that are non-construction and not fine, non-finance costs. Um, and you can use your increment, property tax increment, uh, to pay for those. Things like the cost of the consultant, um, some limited staff costs, um, and the audit costs are examples. Yes, every TIF has to be audited and it's expensive. Uh, audited by the state auditor. Um, it's not fun and it's expensive, and, but you can pay for it with your increments. So it's a related cost. Um, any type of debt, you can, you can use any type of debt that you want. Typically, municipalities use bonded debt through the state bond bank, but there are other types of debt you find cheaper or you want to use. Absolutely, you can use them as long as they're approved by your voters. So in the TIF plan, in the finance plan, if you know the types of debt you're going to use, make sure it's in the plan. And then once everything's approved and you start incurring debt, um, as you know, you know, as you when you bond, the voters have to approve it. That has to have under TIF, whatever kind of debt you use, the voters have to approve it, um, even if it's not bonded debt. Um, statute limits the number of TIFs that can be approved on the state level to 14. There are 10 active right now, and as far as I know, there are none in the queue. So there are four slots available. Uh, finally, a couple changes in statute this year, uh, to statute. Uh, municipality can now pay debt interest with increment for two years after your first debt. Um, you wouldn't pay for it, it was a debt before. Uh, you always been able to use band, bond anticipation, no anticipation notes kind of a, a tool to bridge until increment starts coming in. Um, now you can do that and it doesn't trigger your debt period. Um, so you can do that for the temporary, temporary bridge, then you bond uh, and that triggers your, your debt period. And uh, you can you just subsume the, the band into the, into the bond. Uh, districts are no longer allowed to go back to deputy to adjust your boundaries. So you've got to get it right the first time when you apply. <clears throat> you have to draw your boundaries. So you can't change them anymore. Um, and as I mentioned before, now municipalities are responsible to pay the ed fund for the full original taxable value of all the properties in the TIF district. So if, if, you're, if the value you have in your books for that property <coughs> goes down, it doesn't matter. You owe the ed fund what the original taxable value was. So that's tip in a nutshell. Um, happy to try to answer questions. Uh, I see there's um, Andy had one. Is relation to base? Oh, here. Yeah. So I uh, know. Okay. Good. It yeah. doesn't get inflated. No, it stays constant. Um, that's been a source of contention with the legislature's economists over the years, but it's just too hard to try to reevaluate every year. It just stays the same. So one of my thoughts, right, is if we draw a district around the, uh, the downtown EDI area, 
right? And let's say that uh, Carolyn or Haymaker puts in an amazing new kitchen, right? And really increases the property value there yeah. in a way that's not related. It's within the tip dis dis district, but it's not related to our infrastructure activity directly. Does that incremental tax still count um, as a TIF increase? Yeah. It happened to happen in that district, even though it yeah. wasn't. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of a side benefit. If, 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 if a property is improved, um, you still get the benefit district. of the increment in the district. Yeah. It's the flip side that, that they're going to be looking at. The, yeah. the infrastructure that you're going to pay for has to be related to the development. So if, if their development isn't related to the infrastructure, that's okay. But the other way around right. can't occur. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Great presentation. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> Um, yeah. Hi, Fred. Um, I'm Izzy. Um, this Hi. is all very new to me, so I took a lot of notes. Um, but I think one of my biggest questions, if you could just put into layman's terms for us, is ultimately we have a library that we're looking at like a $15 million price tag, and we are really thinking creatively about how to fund that. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on like, if you know Middlebury well enough to kind of give like a timeline of what this may look like um, and how that may, you know, play out for us. But ultimately, I think um, the conversations around the TIF have been around how do we fund this $15 million library? Yeah. Um, the timeline you're looking for is for TIF or for the library? I would love um, an idea about like the TIF. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a basic thing is remember that the, the TIF tool can't pay for the library. It's, it, if the library and other development in the EDI, like Ben Franklin, um, you know, whatever else is going to be built down behind Town Hall, along the river, um, if that's all private development, um, and there's infrastructure required for that private development to occur, like a parking garage, uh, road improvements. Um, I mean, that's, that's how to, I would think about putting this all together. Just remember that the, the money raised by TIF can't go towards that 15 million for the library. It can go towards infrastructure that will support the library, especially if there are other, there's other private development occurring along with the library. A good example of that, and it'd be a great field trip if you can, if, you probably been there, South Burlington, did Newtown Center. Uh, that's, they did a town hall, a library, community center, um, all non-taxable. So they're not, that's, those buildings aren't generating new revenue for them to pay for the infrastructure, <coughs> but there was so much else getting built there as well housing and, and new private development that that generated enough revenue uh, to help pay for the infrastructure that was needed for everything all of it. so that's kind of the way to look at it is a big um a, a project larger than just the library that includes both public facility and private development <coughs> and what is what is the infrastructure they need for that so you got to look at both sides of the coin. What's the infrastructure that's needed? How much is that going to cost? And will the private development that's going to come out of it going to generate new, enough new revenue to pay itself? And, and think about other revenue sources, too, to put together with it. Great. Thank you. I was also looking at... Um... I didn't get to the timeline. But... Oh. No, oh yeah, if you could share that, like uh, based on yeah. what you're what you're seeing, maybe, you know, uh, what have other towns done? How long does it take from, yeah. you know, this conversation saying, yeah, TIFT may be an <clears throat> option that we want to actually, you know, breaking ground? It's typically, you know, 18 to 24 months to get to the point where you're presenting a TIFT plan to your, 
to your voters. Uh, that includes all of that pre-planning activity that I mentioned, a lot of which you've already done. So you can build on what you've already done, you know, your downtown plan and ultimately the new zoning, <coughs> all the other stuff that you've already done, you build on that and probably develop a new plan in eight, 12 months. And then <coughs> from the time you have get, have plan ready, and get through your voters, the Pepsi, you know, that's another uh, three to six months. Awesome, thank you. And then my other question that I had was, um, at what point do you get commitments from the private sector? And is that something that needs to be a full commitment when you present to this state? Do you need to say, these are the businesses that have committed that are going in? Or are we taking that risk saying, you know, we have this much square feet and we hope to get a private company that does this kind of business, but we don't necessarily have to have the business committed when we um, present to the state? Um, I've seen it happen both ways. Um, it's much riskier to go to the state with your plan, not having developers um, who are partnering with you. Um, and let me, I want to divided kind of between the resulting businesses that might occupy the buildings the developers <coughs> build, that's one thing, that can come later. But when you're putting together your TIF plan and you go to the state, you, I think you want to have at least one developer that, that's going to build a project that'll provide enough revenue to cover you. And then one or two more, that's great to, you know, add uh, you know, it, it really depends on the project and what you're trying to do. But um, I would have them at least lined up. You don't have to have a firm commitment from them uh, when you go to the state. It's better if you did. Um, and then once you do get approval from the state, um, between the time you get that approval and you go to the voters on a bond, you know, whatever debt you're going to use, you got to have them lined up then. <laughs> you need to have your developers all in line, ready to go, so that when the voters vote on the bond, they're ready to put shovel, uh, shovel into the ground on the development once you've com completed the infrastructure. Great, thank you so much. Some things can happen concurrently, but you, know, <clears throat> you can, uh, you know, big pieces of infrastructure like a parking garage or a road need to get done and then they do the project. But then there's other stuff, lighting, sidewalks, things like that you might do while they're building. But um, yeah, you want to have their commitment before you go to the voters uh, to put, your, put their dollar on the line. <laughs> Great, thank you. I learned so much tonight. So thank you so much for that. My pleasure. Hi, Hi Fred. Fred. Hi. How are you? I'm great. Uh, I had a, just a simple question. Uh, you mentioned quite a few times about there's a lot of work involved, a lot of staff resources. I'm just curious to know how much. Is it to the level that we need to add staff mm. to this, or do we need somebody with expertise to deal with this? Uh, I'm wondering how towns like St. Albans and South Burlington, how did they handle this, <coughs> uh, this question? Mm -hmm. um, they both use consultants, and I think they both use... Um, White? <laughs> White and Burke. White and Burke? Yeah, White and Burke. Yep. Uh, it works so close with them for years, you should guys remember. But they don't get old. But they still uh, had at least two people um, you know, during that period when they're putting together the TIF plan and the application to the state, um, St. Albans, for example, the town manager and um, I forget what his position is, but he's uh, community development, I think. Uh, they they worked almost full time on it during okay. that period, but now you know they're it's just a smaller part of their job, and it really depends how. Um, fully you want to engage the consultant too. They can do 
as little or as much as you want them to. Yeah. Uh, but in, in South Burlington, um, she worked on it full time. You know, during that period when they were working on the, the plan and the finance plan and presenting to the state, that was, was a lot of hours put in during that period. It's going to take your town clerk, your treasurer, you know, because all, all those numbers that have to be put together, they, you know, what's the value of the property now? What would the value of the property be with a new um, hotel on it? That type of thing. Your valuation uh, department has to work on all that. So, uh, again, the consultant can help a lot, but there's still a lot of front work that has to be done by staff, especially during the periods leading up to approval. Yep. And then you need, you know, your your public works department is going to be overseeing the, the infrastructure for a couple of years. Yep. Um, so, yeah, they they all, all the tips that I worked on at the state, they all use Burton White consulting. Yep. <clears throat> um, but the staff still put in a lot of hours. Thank you. I had a question, um, and maybe maybe you know this for St. Albans or a similarly sized town. What sort of upfront costs did they incur to get to the point that the TIF was approved? Uh, my recollection was somewhere between, and I'm including Hartford in here too, it was like between <coughs> twenty and forty thousand dollars. Okay. Not staff That's just actual um, costs. Other right. But you, and keep in mind, you can pay for that af afterwards, later. Mm -hmm. You know, you incur those costs, but you can pay and pay yourself back for that out of tip increment. Okay, thank for you. The lady cost. You got any questions? Any questions? <coughs> thank you. Any other? Heather or Andy, any other questions? Okay, we really appreciate it, Fred. Uh, I'm sure there'll be questions that come up afterwards. And uh, Emily has a question. Oh, Emily. <coughs> Do you want to come up? Yeah, come so they yeah. can hear you. Fred, how are we defining infrastructure? Um, it's pretty broad, um, and it, it's actually... They use the, the statute uses the term um, doesn't use the term infrastructure. It uses the term I, I'm not recalling right now, but it includes things like it can include things like property acquisition, um, things like that. But generally, it's um, like a water, sewer, roads, um, sidewalks, um, lighting. Um, those types of brownfield cleanup. Um, so it, it, there is a list that's defined in the statute of things that are qualifying. Okay. And then I guess my second piece is given the inflationary costs that we're seeing right now, I, I was in South Burlington when that TIF was developed, um, but they a lot of that burden got put in before this cycle of inflation took place and so i'm yeah. wondering what you're seeing now are municipalities pulling back from this a little bit or is the revenue projection still there that it will make up for it yeah i i don't know for sure i'm not there anymore i, I do talk to the person who replaced me quite often because we were working on legislation this year but uh there haven't been any applications for a long, for a while, Killington just got approved, mm. so they're really the only <clears throat> municipality that's been approved since COVID. So they're the only ones experiencing, you know, the the delays and the increased costs um, because of COVID. But actually, they haven't started their infrastructure projects yet, so they haven't actually experienced that. <laughs> they will starting like next year, but. Um, that is a concern. I, I always recommended that, and, and the consultants, White and Burke, always recommended, you know, a, a inflationary percentage in the estimates, in the um, in, in estimating the infrastructure costs. 
uh, even before you know these issues. So, um, yeah, you got to be careful about that. And um, another way to get at it is on the other side of the coin by having a surplus of revenue, making sure you got more, you're going to get more revenue than the cost of the bond and the interest and the cost of the infrastructure. But yeah, it's it's a it's tricky. Hopefully that'll, you know, that issue won't be as, as pressing an issue going forward as it has been the last four years. Well, certainly the ones who got their project done before the inflation have benefited by it, so. Exactly. <laughs> it wouldn't be our case. Okay, thanks, Fred. <clears throat> Thank you all. Great to see you all. Thank you so much. Same. Any Thanks. questions, let me know. And hopefully, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, Kathleen's got the PowerPoint and distribute that to everybody. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Emily, we got you in the hot seat. <laughs> Here we am. <laughs> we have. Um, so first on the agenda for DPW is the paving improvements we put out to bid um, <coughs> reclaiming Lower Foot Street, portions of Lower Foot Street, and then also shimming an overlay for Lino Lane, Kings Row, Maycliff, um, I guess that was it, and then paving Middle Road South. Um, and so we received two bids. Um, and the apparent low bid was Champlain Construction. Um, and so I, I think I gave David the um, engineer's recommendation to approve that award for 500, and, well, $474,870.91. Yeah, um, we have that. Okay. But then I would also like, so I would like to approve that, but I'd also like to look at or get approval to amend that in initial package to add Brookside Drive-In. There's an amendment one. That was 3,250. Oh. What's that? 3,250. So that is an amendment to the actual engineering contract. Okay. Um, initially, when I contracted them, I had not included Middle Road South um, <coughs> from talking with Bill and other public works. We decided that that would be a good use of paving gravel roads mm -hmm. just because it's a segment sort of in the middle of all paved roads. And so it, in terms of um, our truck usage, it makes it harder to maintain it in the wintertime and it's just hard to maintain it anyway. It's a cut through. Um, without a lot of, I think there's only two houses on it. Um, and so we wanted to incorporate that. And then um, this increase in cost would also be the additional work associated with adding Brookside into the contract and the engineering involved in that. So for that one, the amendment number one is for $3,250, which would bring the engineering total to $37,050 including the project oversight construction phase engineering so how much is the brookside drive piece? brookside drive we haven't put it out to bid yet um the engineer's estimate he used um his original estimate numbers which brought the total <coughs> up to 662,000, but he that was for everything um, and so really like Brookside Drive with the <coughs> using the engineers numbers just for Brookside Drive and the <coughs> actual values that Champlain construction bid would only increase the contract by $47,487 so it'd be, bring the paving total to 522,000 or no 572,000 using the engineering numbers. Um, so it was like a $52,000 increase to do Brookside. I think Nick would, Nick would be happy. Brookside so would make a lot of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sides needs it. 
So how would the approvals go, Emily? So I would like an approval for the actual <coughs> Champlain construction award, and then we'll have to go back to them um, and get either do it as an amendment or as a change order to get Brookside Drive added into the package. Could we do that at the next meeting once yeah. you've got some numbers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Why don't we uh, Why don't we take them uh, two separate motions? <coughs> one for the uh, for the current bid from uh, Champlain Construction that's recommended from the Infrastructure Committee, and then we'll do uh, uh, a motion for Amendment One um, on the uh, Engineering Services, and then next meeting. Um, Emily may have the cost for Brookside Drive to us, and, and we'll approve that. We'll look, we'll look to approve that at that time. So I would seek a, a motion. <laughs> <I'm>, on the <laughs> right, I move to award the Town of Middlebury's 2023 Pavement Improvements Project to Champlain Con Construction Company, Inc. for $474,870 and Mine says 70 cents, but you said 91 cents. 70 cents. 70 cents. Okay, okay. <laughs> With the potential future amendment to add Brookside Drive to the contract. Second. Move and second. Are there any other questions or comments on this? <clears throat> there are none. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. And then I move to approve amendment number one agreement for final design, bid phase, and construction phase engineering service for $3,250, bringing the overall contract price to $37,050. Second. Moving second. Any comments or questions on that? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Emily, okay. can I ask a question before we move on? You can, but I stand corrected on the bid amount. It is 91 cents. Okay. I, do I need to make Friendly an amendment? Am am <laughs> <laughs> I amend it to Sorry. 91 cents. <laughs> And the <laughs> amendment of 91 cents, everybody okay? I'm going to okay? drop a quarter Our, off. Yeah, I'm going to donate yeah. that to 20, the town. 21 cents. <laughs> Who uh, seconded that motion? I did. You did? You good with the friendly yes. amendment? Uh, <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, a few of these streets are, are dead ends. So how does, what does, including the one I live on? So what will paving look like for the residents? You know, are we going to not be able to get to our homes? For a certain period of time you will be able to get to your home okay. um I, it'll probably be reduced to one lane or okay well i will it'll be a lot of communication getting homeowners in and out of their driveways in advance so that if we're coming through with the paver they can have their car strategically mm. placed so, okay okay yeah there will be a coordination involved okay <laughs> there, the, the office pave pave. one side then they move on to the next side yeah right? the paver is typically nine foot wide the swath that they're g doing so the road's wider than that and i mean they can right. go out further than that but that <clears> usually is narrow as they can get it okay um so they usually do one one side one and side then and then they'll do the, the other side. okay and how long can we expect there to be something happening It'll, Once it starts it, happening, it won't. These rows are pretty short, so yeah. it won't be too bad. Um, it's the plan is to do a shim coat, just a half inch shim, and that'll help fill in all of the voids, and then come back in and do an actual surface treatment. And it's just one pass for the mm -hmm. surface treatment, so it'll be one pass of the shim and then one pass for the sh surface treatment. So okay, it'll be pretty quick. It's like one day of paving. Uh, okay, right like a couple, like a couple days total. Yeah, or something. Be. Okay. That, that sounds nice. Thank you. Yeah. Lower Foot Street will take a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, and I'm just thinking if, if we do wind up doing um, Brookside, then we'll have everyone in here because people will speed when they cut through because mm -hmm. the condition of the road is the only thing keeping people from using that. It does, as a, it does slow traffic. Yeah. <laughs> so. so narrow it down in the, in the middle where there's no homes or anything. Narrow it down to nine feet. Okay, so. we'll, we'll neck it down. Yeah. <laughs> Put in some speed bump. Um, so next <coughs> on the agenda is the asset management engineering. And this is just <coughs> discussion at this point. Um, I've been working with Aldrich and Elliot, and they it we can get funding from the state to create the asset management engineering. 
and it will benefit any of our SRF funding. Um, it'll give us more points and mm -hmm. that way we'll gain funding once we complete it. And the state will forgive up to $50,000 of work related to asset management. And so the <coughs> quote that we have right now from Aldrich and Elliott is $33,100. I've been going back and forth with them about whether or not we can look at the rate structure as a component of it. And I don't know if the state will forgive that aspect of the scope. Um, and so we can build it in later if, if the state will forgive it or we can discuss later if we want to pay for it out of the capital funds. But the next step for this is I think I provided the rather large packet of uh, 70 page or whatever it is agreement, but the state has to approve it and then it will come back to us and back to the select board for approval. So nothing to do now other than the steps of how we're moving forward with it. The other component of, so this is strictly for water and water infrastructure. The other component that we're looking at right now is the lead service line inventory, mm. which um, we do have funding set aside from the state I haven't submitted for it yet because I, I'm trying to figure out how much or if we can do all of it in-house. We ha Our water crew <coughs> is installing new endpoints right now and so they're going into yep. basements. Mm -hmm. And so I built an app that they can go in while they're doing the endpoint work and do a quick survey of what they see for pipe material in people's mm -hmm. basements, which is what we have to do for the state inventory. So depending on how it works out, we're just piloting it starting this week. Um, but if it seems feasible, we could potentially get the funding from the state instead of hiring an engineer to do it. We just have to show a few comparable quotes from an engineering company, and then we would be able to receive the funding. So I think we can do most, I think we can do it in-house, and I think we should do it in-house, but I want to make sure it's not overburdening anybody um, to do it. I can do a lot of it on GIS. Um, it's, it's a pretty straightforward inventory, and working with the college, they have theirs pretty well documented, so um, I, I think we could get away with doing a lot of it, but I'm still feeling it out. So. This asset management plan can also be credited um, <coughs> towards the lead service line inventory work also. So it sort of has a cross benefit there as well. Have we ever had a full asset management plan for all of our water? N not to, I called Dan to ask him and he said no. But so I think like, we have all of the mapping from Phelps Engineering, and so I think historically there was a lot of background information, but I don't think it was a full-blown asset management plan. So this would bring it all into one exactly. plan <coughs> yeah. document. And then so in this, I also added some additional funds to have them go out and do survey in areas where there are, are more, more unknowns. We've so we have areas that are in question. Yes, there are some gaps. <laughs> yes. So this will help. Um, they built that into their estimate that, too. So. So that's included in that. That's included in that. Okay. Value. Thanks. Yep. And um, would the survey lead pipe survey portion of this include East Middlebury or just? They are doing their own. They are yep. okay. Okay. Yep. They have to do it too. They but yes. it won't be this. It'll be any that. supplier okay. has to do. That it. makes sense. Yep. I love that you just said you made an app. Like, that was awesome. I just, I just well, made an app. I didn't really, like, the app already exists. Oh. I just developed the survey that we need. Oh, on gotcha. Piano. I thought you made an app. I was No, like, I didn't make an app. She's genius. I mean, I downloaded an app, if that counts. <laughs> it's, all, it's all GIS. <laughs> um, moving on. So, stormwater, Mary Hogan stormwater design. I had originally included this work in the feasibility an analysis that was townwide that we received the grant funding for, but um, just due to the legwork involved with getting that grant finalized, I don't think we'll see it for a few more months. And 
I'm, my concern with this property is that we are sort of doing our own design and the school is doing their own design and we're trying to submit both of them simultaneously to the state. Um, and the rush on it is that the state is rolling out the next wave of funding which will go towards construction on these school sites and it might be as soon as this fall. So the sooner we can get <coughs> to a design level that we can apply for funding, the better position we're in to yeah. get funding. I have no idea how much will be available. I, with their design funding, it was barely a token. But I would hate to miss an opportunity um, by not being prepared for yeah. it. Um, and so I reached out to Aldrich and Elliot for that one as well and so they've provided um, an agreement to do the engineering um, for $40,300. I walked the site with them two weeks ago and we came up with some different ideas and different solutions for how we can um, use the two parking lot areas as our potential treatment areas. One of the benefits is that the parking lot, the town-owned parking lot that's on Mary Hogan Drive is in really <coughs> bad gotcha. condition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it gives us a perfect, perfect excuse to dig it up and then be able to pave over it and potentially tap into funding to help do it. Yeah. So that's sort of my thought process on that one. Um, but the goal would be to get this engineered so that we're in a pretty good state to be able to both apply for grant funding and be able to tap into the school funding that will be made available by the state this fall. So this just breaks out what we were doing into two so you can expedite this one section of exactly. it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And really we can it also allows us to put something else into the feasibility study. It's not like we lose okay. the effort altogether. <coughs> And we're not double dipping by the school also doing their own design because we are only designing the portions of the Mary Hogan property that the town owns. Correct. Or is their design going to like leak into ours or have similarities to ours? When you say leak. I guess <laughs> like, you know, like, oh, this is town owned property. The design stops here. So, or are they going to like flow together and we have to have some kind of. I just think it's ironic that you're using these I, water terms. When terms. We're talking stormwater, yeah. I know, I know. So, the way our actual flow works on the site is skating rink over sort of flows to the east to Barnesbrook and then tennis courts over roadway parking lot flows more southwest. And so there is a point in the southwestern corner where both might flow together <laughs> <laughs> and converge. And so then it would be a conversation of us working together. They would potentially help fund if we do an in-ground um, sand basin or something in the parking lot. Do they want to send flow our way? And then they would help share the cost on that. Or, or I mean, <coughs> right now it's kept separate. But gotcha. they're actually absorbing a lot of the flow from the courthouse and that parking lot and the buildings up connecting back out to Court Street. All of that comes down a drainage swale and goes on to the school part. And so gotcha. when they're doing design, when you're doing design for stormwater, you're responsible to design for anything that's coming on to your property. So they have to incorporate that into their design, which gotcha. greatly increases any capacity they have to design for. Is this part of, all part of the change to the grandfather properties, or what's driving This is part of the three-acre rule, the new 9050 stormwater permit. Yeah. So that is a site that was, has more than three acres of impervious, yeah. and it has an expired stormwater permit. And so because of that expired permit, it has to be brought back into mm -hmm. compliance with current standards. And it expired just because of the timing or because we it didn't? It expired because the state hadn't come out with the new rule yet. Oh. And so the state wasn't renewing these um, until they came out with the new <coughs> permit and the new rule, which they did in 2017. 
and on. Okay. So I get the the actual permit was 2020 that it came into effect. December 1, 2020. Just wondering if it's the same thing that's impacted those properties that you're working on the stormwater for uh, south of town. Adams Acres. Yeah. Is, that's a three-acre permit. Yeah. Um, Woodland Park is a three-acre permit that yeah. we're. So it's all part of that same. It's all yeah, but the schools got pulled out separately, <coughs> from the state, and so the state's trying to work with the schools to allow funding, and so we're designing separately from the school and so we have to pay for our design separately but if we submit together we mm. can tap into the construction funding okay mm. understood do you know where they're at on their design Very like have we collaborated okay i met with them a month <coughs> or so ago and they i i don't think they even realize how much extra area flows on oh yet. so gotcha. we have to circle back and have that whole conversation any other questions pleasure of the board i'll move to approve <coughs> removing the mayor hogan stormwater design objective out of the scope of the upcoming stormwater feasibility study and authorize the public works department to contract for the mayor hogan Stormwater design work separately. Second. <coughs> Moved and seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Moving on. Um, we, the wastewater team has been working with some very antiquated portable generators. Um, I think they had five or six originally and all built originally in the 70s and now they're so antiquated that they can't get parts or repair them <coughs> so they um, did some research to figure out what they would actually need and got quotes from a few different vendors for six different models and from working through their needs and also meeting with Eric Steele down at DPW um, they determined that the <coughs> generator that's at Milton Cat would be the best generator to meet their needs and is actually in stock, which <coughs> others have a 50 or 52 week lead time, so mm -hmm. that's a huge benefit. Um, but because of that, we have been setting money aside in the fund, in the equipment fund for this purchase, but there, it wasn't scheduled to be bought until the next cycle mm. where we can actually um, build it in and so they're asking permission to be able to put down the 20 percent down payment on it for eight thousand five hundred dollars the total generator cost is forty two thousand five hundred um be able to put it down now so that they can secure that generator while it's actually on site so we don't have the lead time of a year to get a generator and then in the next cycle we'll be looking to buy an additional one and i i think with all of the pump stations that have been getting permanent generators installed, two generators they're thinking will hopefully meet their needs mm. moving forward. And these these can cycle different size pump stations, so um, they're a little more functional than what they had been working with. And that was in our next FY's budget. It, so you're just looking to. It's in there. <coughs> it's in there as of June 13th. <laughs> In our next conversation, our budget <laughs> conversation. <laughs> so this Milton cat, is that comparable in quality to the other higher priced things right. I see? Yeah, so they went through, both Jeremy and Eric went through and made sure everything was comparable. Um, but this one happens to be available, so. <coughs> available and cheaper. Yeah. And um, do you expect to get 50 years out of these or? Is it not the 70s anymore? <laughs> I, don't, I don't honestly know the lifespan. I would assume it would be at least a 25-year lifespan, but I don't. they don't use them that often. I mean, I think it's almost they have to use them just to keep gaskets and whatnot lubricated right, sort of right. thing because it, it, this is um, the situation in the holiday storm that we had. They, the... <coughs> When the power went down over at Halliday Road, we lost the pump station, and so they had to bring a generator over there 
generator failed, so in the time that they had to go all the way back to the plant to get a replacement generator, the uh, pump station had overflowed. Oh, wow. So. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Pleasure of the board. So I move to approve the down payment of $8,500 towards the purchase of the CAT QAS45 generator from Milton CAT to be used by the Public Works Department. Second. Movement seconded. <clears throat> All in favor? Aye. 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 I was going to ask you if you had any questions, Heather, and I, <laughs> I saw the thumb already up. So. <laughs> Next is the Halliday Road culvert replacement proposal for professional services. Um, you may recall I submitted for a structures grant to replace the culvert immediately adjacent to the Halliday Road pump station. It's the bottom is completely corroded out and it's the first section of it has separated and so it's starting to fail. You can see a deflection in the roadway and that road was one that we were going to go after a class two um, paving grant, but I didn't want to pave over a failed culvert. So step one was to replace the culvert. And I did just get <coughs> word today from the state that we are receiving that grant. I don't, it's not finalized yet, so I don't know the final dollar amount on it, but I would assume it would be in the 200,000 range. And then we have a 20% match attached to it. Um, but so this is for the engineering on that design. I, the, the state, um, I asked them to do the hydraulic study for us. And so th um, that's been the hydraulic analysis has been removed from this engineer's estimate and soil borings has been removed from this estimate because we're pretty aware of what the soils are over there. So the total estimate or the total um, agreement is for 14,000. 500 from Otter Creek Engineering for structure replacement. Questions? So, what, is, <coughs> so do you know what it's going to cost after, after this to replace it, actually? This will provide a cost estimate once we, once we get through it. Okay. The problem with the structure over there is that there is a force main and a gravity sewer pretty close underneath that current structure. The current structure is a five foot corrugated metal pipe and hydraulically the capacity of that is sufficient but the way the state wants these designed now they want it embedded right. so that for aquatic organisms there's gravel in the bottom of the pipe. So that means you need to put in a bigger pipe so that you can have a foot yeah. and a half of material in the <coughs> bottom um, and at that depth it'll be resting on our sewer line. And so this, is, this is going to be concrete? Potentially concrete box or an arch. We have to we have to figure that out. Um, we yeah we have to figure out how to deal with the the sewer lines and what we can put in there for a structure. Okay. You want a motion? Yeah, please. Oh, Heather's hand is up. Heather. Uh, oh, you're, you're muted, mute? Heather. No. <coughs> or. Kathleen has muted. Oh, no. oh. Sorry, our lovely Heather. sound went out. <clears throat> can you hear me? Now you yeah. can. Yeah. Um, uh, Emily, the road is pretty low through there. Can we raise the road up? Potentially, that would be like a possibility. The bottom of the culvert, uh, where it is existing now, and raise the road up a little bit because there's a pretty big dip right through there now. That that is a potential solution. Okay. The outlet of yeah. the outlet of the culvert is really perched, so we have to get we we have to get creative there, but we have some options. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay, so I'll move to approve the proposed professional services agreement with Otter Creek Engineering for $14,500 to prepare for the replacement of the Halliday Road culvert. Second. Moved and seconded. Any other questions or comments? Hear none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 
Did I get a thumbs up, Heather? You oh. can't hear, can't hear, us, hear us now. now. <clears throat> All of a sudden, I can't hear you. Now we can hear. Can you, you. hear me? Yes. We can. Yes. We had a motion. I don't know what happened. <laughs> So we had a motion. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, solar. We're good. Um, so moving on, we had Ian Fair of Vermont Solar Fund come to the infrastructure committee two weeks ago and presented a proposal about putting solar panels on the municipal building and also on the skating rink um, sort of as separate opportunities and there was a lot of support for it at the infrastructure committee and they requested that we um, put do an RFP um, to see if there are other vendors out there seeking seeking other vendors um, but I have a lot of reservations in the whole proposal and so I did I put together a draft RFP which is in the packet I think it illustrates how complicated the project is and I would like to step back and put out an RFP for a consulting service to lead the project I think one of the concerns was that we would lose our rate that we're currently locked in because the CPG has already been submitted to the state um, for both projects. I think the skating rink was submitted, or I don't know the actual date, but back in COVID, and so it was granted an extension because of COVID. But the municipal building was submitted on August 29th last year. And so the state does a biennial, biennial review of um, net metering and that allocation of how much it will pay back. And so the concern was that we were going to lose a lot of money if we put the brakes on and waited. Mm -hmm. But in looking at that review, it is less than three tenths of a cent per kilowatt hour that we would be losing. So for this project, for example, over the time frame of a year, that's about $94. Over the lifespan of the project of <clears throat> a projected 35 years, which I think the panels are only guaranteed for 25, but it's sort of assumed that they'll last 35. If you're assuming that full day one production, it would be just over $3,000 that we'd potentially be losing out in revenue by putting the brakes on and hiring a consultant to run this proposal. We, I really, ha especially with the skating rink, we need a structural analysis done. I mean, there are just so many components involved mm -hmm. that haven't been done. So I think step one should be to get approval to hire or to put out an RFP um, for a consultant to figure out. And there's also questions with the proposal that we were given for this is um, a power purchase agreement, a PPA, where the company would own the solar panels, the town would be responsible for property insurance and liability. Um, they'd be mounted on the roofs and then the town would have a buyback option at, I think it was projected around year 14 for this building. Um, and it would be based on a two-year production rate at that point. So, but that's all based on the developer's interest rate, which they can't get the interest rates that the municipality can get. So it right. might make more sense for the town to purchase the panels as opposed. So I just, mm. I think there's a lot of variables that need to be considered. In, it could be considered in the RFP or it could be considered with a consultant beforehand um, just to figure out the best fit for the town to meet our needs. So I am asking for support and issuing an RFP to hire a consultant to do that sort of legwork. 
at least to look at what the cost would be for a Look consultant. at the cost. And I mean, I wrote the, the <clears throat> RFP that's in the packet um, based on templates online, but it's not my expertise by any means. And so I really want that to be reviewed mm -hmm. by an expert in the field. Um, and I just, I think there's a lot of variables involved that we need to sit down and discuss to figure out what we're really trying to gain from it, just so that we get the most out of it. Questions? Heather has her hand up. <clears throat> Heather? Can you hear me? Yes. You can. Yes. Uh, thanks, Emily. So, uh, what do you think the cost will be for the consultant, roughly? Mm -hmm. um, I know it's hard to know, but just, just off the hip number, I'm not going to hold you to it, because I don't think we've budgeted for this type like so I'm just worried about how we're going to pay for it basically so I don't I'm more than happy to get costs I think I think at that point as soon as we start the conversation of taking the con consultant route we are missing out on this current rate we would have to start installing these by September which even like putting out this solar RFP and achieving it by September, I think is. I'm sorry, Emily. I can't hear you. After I talk and you start talking, I can't hear what you're saying. Get closer to the I mic. think it comes back after a little bit of time, but maybe answer another question. I'll let you know when I can hear you. <laughs> okay. so, totally Heather, out. were you looking for the opportunity loss? You can't hear it. She's not hearing anything. Was there something you adjusted last time? after you had this difficulty? Okay. Okay, so any other questions? Um, it, it might be worth just finding out who's out there for a consultant and what it would cost. I think it ought to, so we know how much we're budgeting. Um, I mean, that would still come back to infrastructure and us, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't think that this is an issue to at least look at what yeah. a consultant uh, would yeah. charge us and what services they would, would propose to provide okay. and what their expertise is. You know, I don't know if there's, I mean, it must be somebody in the state who they do exist. specializes <laughs> in this. They, I know the company that we were working with over at the um, police station, the mechanical engineers that were on that, I reached out to them and they said they, looking at their website, they provide consulting services for energy projects and so I reached out to them and yeah. they said that they would be available. So then you can probably find out what the ballpark they charge normally. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you recognizing that this is a project that needs a really like an important investment in <clears throat> making sure that we use the money wisely and something doesn't go wrong so I appreciate you recognizing that and pushing it out to an expert I think that's a really good idea to move forward and and finding out who that is and yep. where they're located and how much it charges I think that's a good thing to move forward on <clears throat> Heather can you hear us yet <laughs> no. Okay. No. Okay. <clears throat> um, so why don't we? Uh, what we're approving is for Emily to go out and see what services are yeah. are available at what price, and then she'll bring it back to us. So yeah. I, I think that's a, a a good ask, and uh, let's go ahead and yep. get a motion to. I move to approve the town to pursue professional consulting services to oversee the RFP process for the town solar projects. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And we'll have, oh, did you hear us? She's back. Ooh. You're back. Fancy. No, she just saw us. She's probably <laughs> reading. <clears throat> okay, next. Next is Boardman Street intersection. VHB has been working um, on a, 
trying to get a scoping scoping study developed um, with VTrans for the Boardman Street Route 7 intersection. Mm -hmm. And in order for that scoping study to be developed, they need select board support for the purpose and need statement that they have provided in this um, packet. Um, and that will hopefully advance it to the scoping study. Okay. Questions? It was a nice little, nice little brief you included in there. <clears throat> yeah. So. I think it would, I mean, I think it'll be a great project having attempted to turn left out of that intersection today. Yeah. Not <laughs> easy. Mm -hmm. It gets busy down there at certain yeah. times of the yeah. day. Okay. It's more and more people turn into Borman now. Mm -hmm. So I'll move to recommend that US 7 Borman Street intersection project advances to the scoping study for, or for more formal alternatives evaluation stage. Second. Second. Are there any questions on that? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Sweet. Okay. Um, project updates. Chipman Hill Reservoir is drained at this point. We <coughs> got the soil borings last week or two weeks ago, so that's complete. Um, and so the engineer will be able to complete their aspect of the engineering and then they work with tank engineers to develop the actual tank engineering aspect of it. The, they, the tank engineers act as a um, subcontractor. So that's all moving forward, still projected to be able to put it out to bid, hopefully in the fall, because that will give them time to um, dial in all of their, you know, getting all of the materials and everything in time for spring construction. Um, South Street, the pipe has started to arrive. We have all of the six and all of the eight inch, started getting some of the 12 inch. We are looking to start in mid-July, I believe, is where we left it. We just met with um, with um, Casella to sign that contract last week. So that's moving forward. Renovations at the police department are complete and already improving the building and the functionality in there, so that's good. Um, <coughs> UVM engineering projects are finally wrapped up. I did include, I don't know, I don't know if they were in this packet, but in the infrastructure packet, there are some pretty neat designs um, for the memorial skating rink site that are kind of creative and interesting. Um, and then Jen Murray presented plans for the townwide bike pedestrian <coughs> plan grant that um, she got funding for last year, so we're trying to move that one forward for a um, townwide future transportation um, planning. So that'll be, she provided a matrix, I think it was from Essex, that was sort of interesting in how they did it, and um, I think she's hoping to develop something similar out of this grant for the town here, and it sort of gives different levels of cost and need and what, what you're serving. Um, in the purpose, so that will be helpful moving forward. I think that's it in the nutshell. <coughs> and we've got the certification for the Towns Road and Bridge Standards Network Inventory. Yeah, so um, it's just the <coughs> just confirmation that we have an up-to-date inventory of highways and road features that comply with the Towns Road and Bridge Standards. Um, and so it's just an annual certification that has to be supplied to the state. Any questions on that? Mm -hmm. Motion? I'll move to approve 2023 certification of compliance for the town road and bridge standards and the network inventory. Second. Second. You can hurry. <laughs> Seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <coughs> Thanks right. a lot, Emily. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> so now, get Kathleen on uh, custodial position. Thank you. Uh, Royce McGrath from the library is also here. 
um, if you have any questions for her. So what this proposal is, is for the uh, town offices and library <coughs> to team up to hire a full-time custodian, 30 hours in the library, five hours in the town offices, uh, to, to address an ongoing issue we've had with finding uh, part-time uh, employees to fill the three positions that we current part-time positions that we currently have um, the personnel committee endorsed uh, the approach and it is budgeted in the FY 24 budget so we would be targeting uh, filling these positions by FY 24 July 1st happy to answer any questions you may have uh, pay, the uh, personnel committee felt that there was a defined need and uh, with it being budgeted um, and um, right now a lot of that is being outsourced and because of the additional <coughs> cost of outsourcing that's not done as frequently uh, so uh, it, it was unanimous on the personnel committee in supporting this so it was costing us actually more by hiring. It would have if we did it every day. Mm. Yeah. We were staying within budget. Uh, it's a difference in in the quality and, the, yeah. and a lot of stuff that's not getting done. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so the only question I have is we we have decided to go with that 35 hours payroll with five hours to the town and 30 hours to the library. Correct. Is there a reason for that, or do we need five hours here, <coughs> or is that why? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do all the cleaning here. And okay, good. Mm -hmm. Take out the garbage. Yep. And, and, and a lot of the routine maintenance type stuff, replacing dead light bulbs and that type, yep. you mm -hmm. know. Setting the clocks. Okay. For example, <laughs> every time I come in for all check warrants, I'm like, oh my gosh, what time is it? All the stuff that's not getting done right is now. Is this a position with benefits? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, pleasure of the board. If there's no questions. <clears throat> I move to accept the recommendation from the personnel committee to establish a full time custodial position for Ilsley Public Library and the town hall offices the town offices <laughs> taking effect at the start of the FY24 budget year. Second. Moved and seconded. Comments or questions? Mm -hmm. Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Uh, Fred's <coughs> with us. Does you want to uh, present this proposed lease agreement, Fred? Is it your... Uh, so key player of this, or? No, I'm, I'm working with Kathleen and David on this. Okay. Jenna says that she's a presenter. Yes. So I wouldn't want to. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to take the glory away. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, uh, <laughs> with, with that introduction, I think, Fred, you should go ahead. Um, but I do want to thank Fred for all of the encouragement he's provided on this project mm -hmm. and, and, and persistence. Come on up, Fred. All right. Um. Briefly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we found, thanks to Danielle Rougeau and Glenn Andrus, and, uh, we found that there is a space that we could uh, move these records uh, mm -hmm. that are, have been on, stretch wrapped on pallets, and moved several times. Uh, it's in Salisbury. There. Former school, you know, they built a new school a few years back. Well, their former school, part of that's been occupied by the town offices, and the other part of it is vacant at this point. And they don't have a viable tenant for it. And uh, we met with the select board chair, Pat Dunn, and toured it, and it's ample space and uh, works with the, from the time or that Danielle and I are able to do this work. So, uh, and it's the same amount of money, $1,000, that we have been paying for the Hanover Center in the prior arrangement. We've had some uh, other arrangements since then, but uh, that's that's where that $1,000 came from, that number. Anyway, uh, uh, so we had a letter from Pat saying that their select board had met on May 10th and uh, had approved this. 
uh, and we could start any time. And we thought it appropriate to draft, at least Kathleen did, so she and David worked something up that uh, you have before you. We, I think the Salisbury Select Board probably meets bi-weekly like you do, and that would be tomorrow night, so he's probably taking the draft lease to them, if you haven't heard from him yet. So uh, we're assuming no news is good news, and uh, if, you auth if you would <coughs> authorize this, then we could proceed. And uh, Kathleen also included in the packet our, our sort of work plan moving forward. Uh, that's evolving, uh, but it's pretty pretty well set. And if there's any questions about that, I can answer that. Thank you. Okay, questions? How much space is that? Are we releasing? Uh, you know, I we don't have a square footage number, <coughs> but it's uh, two large rooms, each room about the size of this room, and it's a part of a former elementary school. So there's bathrooms and yep. Is it kitchen. where the Freemasons were before they moved? Uh, yes, I think there was a fraternal organization there, okay. but I didn't, I didn't yeah. know which one it was. It was uh, Lodge 2, the second oldest lodge in Vermont. <laughs> <It's awesome>. <laughs> <laughs> so, so these these are these are boxed old yep. files, and they need a place that's dry and bright so they can open them up and lay out the stuff mm -hmm. and figure out what needs what can be archived what mm -hmm. what should be kept what's or, duplicates organized, there's organized. all kinds of stuff that was when we moved yep. that just got boxed and and uh, we've handled it quite a few times and uh, thanks to Fred uh, and you know actually small group of them they they're they're working to try to whittle this down and make it so it's more accessible for those who need to get to it so this, good. Is, this is called the backstage work. Nobody's <laughs> being done so, right. Sounds like a really good place to do it, too. It uh, sits up there nice and bright. Those guys will be able to right. read. The, the, they have the space. They, can, they got lots of tables in there. You can just mm -hmm. all these Perfect. Cross Street Bridge files that overlap between the managers and what I collected, and you can sort that out, weed it down. And so this is actually your passion, too, right? Archives and... No, I'm trying to enjoy retirement. It's not really my passion. <laughs> I just... Okay. No one else seems to want to do it. And <laughs> Pleasure of the board. I'll move to authorize the town manager to enter into the proposed lease agreement with the town of Salisbury for temporary storage of files and records for the activities related to the town archive project. Second. Uh, you can answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Moved and seconded. Are there any questions still? <clears throat> Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Hey, Thank thanks, you, Fred. Fred. That was speedy. That was speedy. Mm -hmm. You sat here for a long time for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Kathleen. Yes, uh, at, at long last, we're coming up on uh, a closing on the Maverick gas station on June 6th. <clears throat> so um, I would like your permission, please, to uh, pay the purchase price and any closing costs uh, to them on that day and sign any associated um, documents needed. Has Questions? It been, has it been a year now? Yeah. Have been <clears throat> oh, at <laughs> least, at least. <laughs> we, we, were, we got serious last June, I think you're right. COVID it came up. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah, it's a been a couple of years. <laughs> Back and forth. My computer died. You do. Okay. I've just been sitting here looking professional. Okay. Um, I'll move to authorize the town manager to proceed with the purchase of former Maverick gas station parcel from Global Monticello Group Corporation, and to authorize the town treasurer to issue payment for the for this purchase. Second. Moved and seconded. Second. Are there any questions or comments on this? Okay. We've talked about it at length, so I would. I understand why there's no questions at this point. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Um, I also move that the payment <coughs> required for the purchase will be finalized by the town's attorney prior to the closing, which is currently scheduled for June 6th. The payment will be based on the agreed upon sales price of $295,200, less town's deposit on the property, plus close, co closing costs. Second. Moved and seconded. Again, any questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 OK. 
Okay. Check warrants. Woo woo. I move to approve total expenditures in the amount of $391,073.12, consisting of $284,381.81 for accounts payable and $106,691.31 for payroll for the period of May 10th, 2023 through May 23rd, 2023. Second. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, board member concerns. Isabel? Um, I just want to shout out James Kirby. He's here as someone who recently <coughs> moved to Middlebury and wants to get involved. <laughs> and as we know, that's kind of my story. So I appreciate you coming out to this meeting. Thank you, Welcome. Where, where are you from, James? So, uh, Keene, New Hampshire. So, okay. Um, nice community. Yeah, yeah, yep. My parents grew up in southern Vermont, so oh, across, across down Bells Falls area. So. Oh, I know Bells Falls very well. Yeah. So. Um, right across the river is home to Ken Burns. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, welcome to the community. Thanks. Farhad? I'm good, thank you. You're good? Linz? Yeah, um, so I just want to mention that the, that, um, the youth at uh, MUHS put together or hosted the Vermont State Queer Youth Summit or outright Vermont's Queer Youth Summit um, just this past week and they had about somewhere between 100 and 200 uh, teens from all over the state that came and they had a bit of a march um, from the high school to the town green and a speak out and um, it seemed like a really positive event for a lot of them and and the teens who put it together were able to you know learn how to organize and uh learn to have all those conversations and find consensus which is what we do so um yeah i just uh pointing that out for the community and it's hosted every year at a different high school so if your teen missed it this year there'll be another one next year hey. <clears throat> Heather, are you hearing us or are you reading us? <laughs> I can hear you, Brian, when you talk. I'm having a hard time understanding anyone else. Mm. Um, so I know when you're asking for a vote, but that's about it. Um, it's really, really broken up. Huh. So anyway, I'm all set. I don't have any concerns. Okay, thanks for hanging with us. Uh, so I, I don't have any. Uh, it sounds uh, like we're going to have a nice holiday weekend, uh, big parade. Mm -hmm. I encourage everybody to get out, enjoy, unwind. And uh, usually that's like the kickoff to the start of summer activities. So uh, thanks for, thanks for, uh, we got a nine o'clock, uh, we're done by nine. Was starting to look in peril at one point, but uh, <laughs> we got it. Only 15 minutes late. A, a motion for adjournment would be good. Move. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We adjourn at 8, 8.57. Okay. Thank you.